Is, is that annoying? Is that bothering you? All right. So I did something that bothered Kai a little bit. And I'm sorry about that, Kai, but thank you for being a good support. What do you do when somebody does something that bothers you? You do it back. That's what Kai did. That's right. You're an excellent, excellent volunteer, Kai. That was perfect. A lot of times you do it back, right? Well, we're talking about that because Jesus talked about that today in a reading that we're going to have in a little bit. And he said that when someone does something that bothers you, this is the first thing that you do is you talk to them about it. And you say, hmm, maybe please don't do that. So, Kai, I'm sorry. Maybe next time, right, we could all remember that. that the first thing we do when someone does something that bothers us is we say to them, could you please not do that? If they don't listen, you can go get a grown-up, get a friend, try that. How's that sound? I think we can give that a try? What do you think? Can we try, maybe? Okay. It's hard to do. It's hard for adults. It's hard for kids. But I'm willing to give it a shot if you are. Okay. Let's pray. Do you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, Jesus, help me to remember to to talk to the person person who upsets me. me. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up, Kai. Thank you for being a good speaker. I really appreciate it. And now... What is God? What is God made of? What is the substance of God? What makes God, God? Starting out with the easy questions. Right? One week of vacation and it comes back with this, yeah. Um, the, but these are the questions, you know, you've asked them, I've asked them, we've all asked them, philosophers, poets, theologians, pastors, all kinds of people. We wondered about this stuff, the, the big stuff. What is God? What is God made of? What composes God? Stuff we've been wondering about for a long time, I'm sure. And, and you know, there are some things in life that are easy to know, right? It's easy to know when you're in Michigan, right? You look at a map, and if it's, you're inside a shape that looks like a mitten, you're in Michigan, right? It's, it's easy. It's very, very simple. Uh, what is apple pie? It's very simple. It's two pieces of crust, right? Some apples with some sugar. Uh, some cinnamon, maybe a little nutmeg, my mom's put butter, but basically, you know, as long as it's two pieces of crust, it's a pie. You know, what is, what is matter? What, what makes up the universe? You know, like we've even got that figured out, right? It's atoms, right? Atoms are what make up the universe. So we know all these things, what things are made of, what makes something something, what makes God? Harder question, right? In today's gospel reading, there's actually something very interesting and important about who God is. And it might not seem like it at first, right? Because if, if you read along with it, if you were not napping yet, then now's a good time, you'll probably start. But, you know, if you weren't napping yet, it's, it's this advice thing, right? It's this advice about what to do if someone does something wrong. It might not seem like that has a lot to say about who God is, but it actually does. This is one of the rare moments, I think, in, in Jesus' teaching where he gives uh, fairly straightforward advice. You know, a lot of times when Jesus gives advice, he's like, if your hand sins, cut it off, and you're like, mm, I don't know about that one. You know, or, if your eye sins, carve it out. Like, oh, does he really mean that? You know, I hope not. Oh, geez, what do I do with that one? This one is fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Let's take a look at it. And I... If you have your Bible, we're in uh, Matthew 18. If not, you've got a bulletin. Um, I probably say this every week, uh, but this is a good one to turn down the page, you know, and, and save it for later because it is very practical. It's actually step by step advice on relationships. And not like the Cosmo type of relationships, you know, it's a lot of times we talk about relationship advice, it's like between, you know, married people or partners or whatever. But, but there's a lot more relationship advice to be had. This is relationship advice that applies to all the relationships that we might have. It's not just, you know, nine ways to make up after a fight. Um, it's, it's about work and your neighbor Larry across the street and lacrosse. And I've used this in all kinds of circumstances. So it's, it's very straightforward. Um, and let's, let's go. So uh, Matthew 18, verse 15. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. Step one. Step two is if you are not listened to, 
Take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of the three witnesses. Step three, if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Step four, if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let so what, such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I mean, it's right there. It's all very straight. Jesus, step one, step two, step three, step four. Right? But why? Why does Jesus give this advice in the first place? Why bother with relationship advice? I mean, you might, it might seem obvious to you, especially if you've been in church for a while, that to us, to Lutheran Christians, faith is about relationship. Right? You've probably been hearing that, and you're probably thinking, yes, pastor, relationship. I got it. I've been hearing this my whole life. Please get to the good part. Not every religion is like that. Right? There are some religions, it's not about relationship. It's about what you do. What you do is what matters. But for us, our faith is about a relationship. Because God is fundamentally relational. I mean, the nature of God, the very nature of God is a relationship. We say it every week in worship, where we confess the creed. God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. That is a relationship. That is what God is, and relationships are what God cares about. And, and maybe stating that that's what God is doesn't answer all of the questions. Well, you know, there are a lot of things that we think we have the answer to that we don't have all the answers. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but Michigan is surrounded by these great big giant lakes. And when you're in the middle of Lake Michigan, if you want to know if you're in Michigan or Illinois, good luck. Good luck. It seems simple, but maybe it's not. And people do all kinds of weird things with apples and pies and call them pies. And they, they put lattices on them and they, they make them and they fry them and they do all kinds of weird things. It's very confusing. And then what really blew my mind is when I found out that atoms, right, the building block of the universe, well, atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay. And then protons, neutrons, electrons are made of things. And I'm like, so are atoms really the founding building block of the universe? I'm not so sure. We, we, you know, we still have questions about all these things. Maybe saying God is relational doesn't answer all of the questions that you have, but it gives us enough to go on. And it tells us a lot about who God is and what our lives are intended to be like. The fact that God is giving us this relationship advice means that it's not just about our relationship with God, though that has a lot to do with it. That's what the cross is about. That's why Jesus went to the cross, because God wants a relationship with us not just now, but forever. With you and me and all of us, not just now, but forever. But God also deeply cares, deeply, deeply cares about the relationships that we have with other people. It's not just about that relationship we have with God. God wants to make sure that our relationships with one another exist, that they are good, that they are strong, that they are healthy. It is that important to God that it be that way, right? And, and, and church, I mean, that's what church is. You know, and you, you might think church, and you might think, well, okay, all right, church. You know, church. Church is there. Church is there. I mean, I like this church, even with the squeaking. Um, it's a nice church. Um, but, but this is not the church. And if you're new around here, you're thinking the old guy has finally lost his mind, because obviously church is a building that you go to, and you have worship, and then you leave. But that's not what church really is. This is just a building in which the church gathers, which is you and I. I mean, this, us being together, is the church. Church is relational, because God is relational. And so anytime we gather, right, as Jesus says in the Gospel, anytime two or three gather in my name, I am there. Anything we do together is church. And that can be here, and is in here every week. But it is not only here, and when you leave here, you don't stop being church. If you happen to go to brunch with people from church, guess what? That's church. Uh-oh. Right? <laughs> but it is. If you gather together on a Tuesday morning for a cup of coffee, that's church. Open mic night is church. AA is church. The things that happen that are outside of this room when we're gathering together 
are church because we, you and I together, are church. And sometimes that gets a little rocky. And things happen in church that one person likes or another person doesn't like, and there can be disputes about that, and that is part of it. Anytime there is relationship between people, there is going to be some things that don't go well. And Jesus gives us a practical tool for what to do about that so that those can be healed and well. And I've used it. I mean, I've used this a bunch. I use it all, and I've used it not just in church. I've used it in lacrosse. I've used it at home. I've used it all kinds of places. Again, we're going to look at it again, right? It says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault alone. Go right to the person. Don't, don't come to me. You know, don't talk to Kara. Go to the person. And then it says, if you're not listened to, okay, maybe then you go get Kara. Or someone else. Talk to them again. If they refuse to listen to them, tell it to the church. Okay, maybe that's when you come get me. Maybe. If they still don't listen, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Okay. Well, how does Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Does he kick them out? Does he toss them? Does he say, you can't be here anymore? No, that's really not what Jesus does. Jesus does the opposite, actually. He welcomes tax collectors. He welcomes sinners. He has meals with them. He hangs out with them. He enjoys their company. He just doesn't let them tell him how to live his life. He lives his life the way he knows he's supposed to, and he offers them a picture of a different way and a better way. But he doesn't use this to, to beat people over the head. And, and this verse, these verses, this tool that Jesus gives is sometimes used that way. It's used as a way to, to clobber people. Say, ah, <laughs> I gotcha. The clobber texts, right? That's not what this is. That's not who God is, right? This is given as a tool to help us have good relationships with one another because fundamentally God is relational and God wants a relationship with you and me and everyone and God wants our relationships with each other to be healthy and strong. And so I invite you to use this tool. I invite you to use it and when you're uh, having a bite of apple pie later or looking at a map of Michigan, you know, I hope you'll remember who God is, right? That God is relational and that what God wants more than anything is a relationship with you and me and for us to have good relationships with each other. Amen.